All right, Hebrews chapter 11. If you have your Bibles open there to Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, we're now heading into one of the most studied and beloved chapters really in all of the Bible. Hebrews chapter 11 is commonly referred to as the Hebrew Hall of Faith because in this 11th chapter of Hebrews, God gives us example after example after example of men and women who persevere uh, in, in the face of oftentimes trials or testings or difficulties or distress by exercising faith in God. And so this is a wonderful chapter to just be encouraged in your own personal walk with the Lord when you would then be inspired by the wonderful example of many others that have gone before us. Now the writer of Hebrews is gonna mention by name 17 people 17 people by name, and then many others that he's going to refer to not by name. And again, the whole purpose is that we might be inspired and encouraged to live out our lives with faith in God in the face of whatever persecution or difficulties or distress or trials or testings that we might be going through. In fact, if you just glance real quickly to chapter 12, verse 1, after this whole 11th chapter, just listing a person after person after person who has been a real strong example of someone who exercised faith, in chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So that's the reason why he writes verse 1 of chapter 12 on the heels of chapter 11 is to say basically, since we've been so inspired by such a great cloud of witnesses, all these other people that have gone before us, exercised great faith, let it encourage us to continue to run the race with perseverance, that we might finish well. So that's really the purpose of chapter 11. Now I want to point out, and we're going to pray in a moment and then dig into it, but I want to point out that these, are, these people listed here in chapter 11 are not superheroes of the faith. These are your average, everyday, ordinary people. Now, because they have exercised faith, we, we respect them as kind of, you know, superheroes of the faith, but they're, they're really just as ordinary as you and I are. Uh, they, these, are these are just everyday common people who had faith in God to see them through some of the darkest times of their lives. So when you read this with me, I don't want any of us to think, well, you know, that was for another day and those were for, for some special people who are giants of the faith. No, this is, this is for you and me too because these are very ordinary everyday people. And so let it encourage us as we read through this chapter and be inspired by their example before us that we might run the race with perseverance. Amen? Okay, so that's the lead into chapter 12. Let's, uh, sorry, to chapter 11. Let's first have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you now as we are about to read through chapter 11. We just want to give you praise for who you are and thank you, Lord, for recording for us these wonderful examples that have gone on before us that we might be inspired and encouraged in our own walk with you. And I pray that, uh, Lord, whatever difficulties some are going through here, uh, that you will speak to their hearts and encourage them personally, that they might likewise be men and women of faith, trusting you, uh, looking to you, and, and that you would show yourself strong in their lives uh, for their benefit and for your glory. And we love you, Lord, and we thank you for the opportunity of gathering here in your house tonight. Bless our time now in your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. So here in, in chapter 11, let me read the first two verses. It says, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Now, I, I want to first just give a few bullet points as somewhat of an introduction to this chapter so that we can understand in, in the context what kind of faith that the writer of Hebrews is talking about. Now, I, I do want to point out, though, as I read verse 2, you might notice that it says this is what the ancients were commended for. I like King James Version better. It says this is what the elders were commended for. 
These are people who have gone on before us, but you know, the older I get, I don't really like to think of myself as one of the ancients, you know what I'm saying to you? I mean, you, know, you don't teach your kids, hey, respect your ancients. I mean, you, you, you teach your kids respect your elders, so I kind of like the word elders better, but that's what he's referring to. The men and women have gone on before us, the men and women of Old Testament Scripture, the, many of these names are going to be familiar to us. People who have gone on before us that have finished well and served the Lord well and exercised faith. Now again, verse 1, now faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. King James says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. First thing I want to point out is an important distinction. When the writer of Hebrews is writing here about this whole subject of faith throughout chapter 11, uh, there are three different types of faith, and it's important to note this distinction, that there's a difference between saving faith, the gift of faith, and living by faith. So everybody needs to understand this. There are three types of faith in the Bible. One is saving faith. This is Ephesians 2, uh, verse 8, where it talks about it as by grace you have been saved through faith, and this the gift of God, uh, not of works, lest any of us should boast. So every one of us comes to a relationship with Christ through the exercise of saving faith. That is, that is, we put our trust in who Jesus is. We believe him to be the son of God. We believe by faith that he died on a cross for our sins. That's saving faith. And no one uh, becomes a Christian without exercising that type of faith. That's one kind of faith the Bible talks about. The Bible also talks about the gift of faith. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there are nine spiritual gifts that are listed. There are other passages in the New Testament which really bring the total to 20 spiritual gifts. Uh, But there are nine spiritual gifts listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and one of those gifts is the gift of faith. So this is different from saving faith. You become a Christian through the exercise of saving faith, but there are some Christians who have been given by God this particular gift among several gifts. God distributes the gifts uh, as He wills. And some people have been given by God the gift. It's actually a gift of faith. And what does this mean? It's beyond saving faith. It means that there's actually the ability to trust God with a confidence in the midst of some kind of difficulty. And you know people like this who have this gift of faith that it, the world can be exploding and they just have this measured peace and calm and this confidence in the Lord. Do you, do you know people who have this gift? It's a wonderful thing. I, I do not personally have this gift, okay? When the world is exploding inside, I'm exploding. And, but my wife has this gift. My wife has the gift of faith. There are times where I've seen her just exercise just an extra measure of peace and calm, no matter what's going on. I remember one time years ago, she and I were walking around the neighborhood, and I was going through some, some tests I had to have, physical tests, and I was worried about some of the things that originally that they, you know, were thinking that, you know, you know how you get that, like, well, you might have this, you might have that, and so you have to go through all these testings. And so it turned out to be nothing, so everything's fine. It turned out to be nothing. But in the moment, you know, I didn't know what this is about. And so I remember walking the neighborhood with Terry, and she's like, listen, listen, listen. Okay, that's my wife's voice. She hates it when I do that, and she's here tonight. But anyway, she's like, listen, listen. Just trust God. What's the worst that could happen? You die and go to heaven. <laughs> like, is that, is that supposed to encourage me? I don't, I, I don't, I don't feel encouraged right now. But, but she's basically like, you know, just trust, like the big picture. And it's true, like big picture. What's the worst? I mean, you're going to go to heaven. But at the moment, that didn't really seem very comforting. But she has that gift. And if you know people with that gift, you, you, you love to be around them when things are going nuts in your life. Because they have this measure of just confidence and trust in the Lord. It is a spiritual gift that God distributes to some people. Then there's this third type of faith that is living by faith. Uh, This is the faith that he's talking about here, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11. This is the kind of faith that all of us, having gotten through the first kind, which is saving faith, if you're a believer, God wants us to exercise faith on a regular basis, to just kind of walk in this trust of God, in this confidence of who he is. Now, be very careful because the whole subject of faith has been, you know, butchered in terms of some, 
some circles of how they teach the topic of faith. It is not faith in faith. It is faith in God and having a trust in Him who holds the universe in the palm of His hand and it is resting in who He is and believing that because of the intrinsic nature of God that He's good, that everything that happens, it, it's going to be okay because God is good and at the end of the day, He accomplishes His good purposes in my life. This is Romans 8.28, right? In your life, in my life, we can trust God. He works all things together for our good according to His purposes in Christ Jesus. So we can trust Him. He's going to work everything out. He's good. And we trust in who He is. And we don't trust in results. We trust in the character and nature of God. And that's where our confidence lies. That's where our trust lies. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, but, you know, listen, life's going to throw you some curveballs. And whether or not you have necessarily the gift of faith, we are all to walk in this confidence and trust in the Lord. This is that living faith. This is operating and exercising in faith. So um, that's the first thing to note, that there's a difference between these different types of faith, saving faith, the gift of faith, and living by faith. For you note takers, here's another point that's important to, to understand. Faith involves, quote, seeing what is unseen. Now, I listed all the verses up there for you. I'm going to quickly rattle them uh, off with you. The number of references to the times uh, that uh, chapter 11 uses the word, some reference to sight, to, to some reference to sight. So I'm just going to highlight it with you. You can follow along if you'd like or just listen. Uh, for example, verse 1, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Verse 7, by faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. Verse 10, for he was looking forward, this is Abraham, he was looking forward, looking, looking, seeing, looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Verse 13, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. Verse 14, people who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. Verse 23, By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child. Verse 26. This is Moses. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. In verse 27, by faith he left Egypt not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. So faith involves some measure of sight, not physical sight, but spiritual sight. This is why Paul would write in 2 Corinthians 4, 18, that we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, for that which is seen is temporal, but that which is unseen is eternal. So it involves some measure of sight, but we're talking with your spiritual eyes, not with physical eyes. As we get older, this is just the reality of life, as we get older, our physical senses will diminish. It gets harder for us to see, it gets harder for us to hear. Uh, our taste sometimes goes away, the ability to touch and feel or smell. The older we get, our physical senses tend to diminish. But the older we get in the Lord, our spiritual senses tend to become more heightened. And as we walk with the Lord longer and longer, we are more able, we can better hear His voice, we can better see things, spiritually speaking, we can better feel His presence and know Him in a way that transcends the physical senses. This is the kind of thing that exercising faith is all about. It is growing in our relationship with Him and thereby our senses, our spiritual senses become more awakened and more heightened the older we get. 
Faith is spiritual sight. And then the third bullet point before we get further in our chapter here is faith is an action, not just a feeling. And I wanted to point this out by just giving you an example of some of the first few people mentioned here in chapter 11. Uh, It says that Abel offered. It says that Noah built and Abraham went. Okay, just as a, a few examples. You notice that, you know, the verbs employed there tell us that faith is not just a feeling and it's not just sitting around hoping God will do something. Faith is acting on as much as we can, as far as, as far as what we can do, and it is trusting God for the rest. So it involves some measure of action. It's, again, it's not just sitting around, well, I have faith that, that God's going to do this and God's going to do it, and God may do this and God may do that, fine. But faith is not just a feeling or a sense. There's actually some action to be, to be exercised in response to the trust and the confidence that you have in God, who is always faithful. So, you know, don't, don't think of faith as just, well, something that... that you know, I, it's just this feeling and trust and God does everything. God can do anything He wants. But these examples we're going to read are about people who exercised some measure of action in response to this trust and confidence that they had in the Lord. So please note that as we go through this list. So, in chapter 11, verse 3, no, no greater place to begin after the first two verses, then with a faith faith lesson regarding the story of creation. And he writes in verse 3, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. There's two Hebrew words that talk about the creative nature of God. One is uh, bara, which means to create out of nothing, and one is asa, which means to make something with, uh, with material that has already been created. And when it speaks here about the universe, it uses that word bara, meaning God created the universe out of nothing. That, you know, He's God, and so He created everything out of nothing. Um, this is an important place to start. The reason that the writer of Hebrews, before he even gets to the first name of the first person as a good example of faith, starts with this point about creation is because if you can accept that much by faith, that God is the creator of the universe, then guess what? No difficulty you go through is going to be any problem. Because when you realize that your difficulty or your challenge is going to be met by the one who created the universe out of nothing, boy, it sure gives you hope in the midst of whatever you're facing. Because it's like, okay, my difficulty, my situation, my thing I'm, I'm dealing with, I'm going to put my faith in the one who created the universe. And if he created the universe, probably what I'm going through is not too difficult for him right? This is Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17, when Jeremiah would write one of my favorite verses, Ah, sovereign Lord, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thine outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. Nothing is too difficult for God because God created everything and as creator of the universe, he can handle whatever my situation is. I'm going to share a few quotes with you in regards to the whole idea of creation. Um, The British physicist Stephen Hawking uh, would, would have disagreed with my statement about God creating the universe. Dr. Hawking came out with a book in 2010 called The Grand Design. And in his book, The Grand Design, he asserts that God did not create the universe, but he points to something that he called the M theory. Now, the M theory basically is, is this. It's the idea that the physical laws of the universe inevitably led to the spontaneous creation of the universe without the necessity of a creator or any other kind of what we would call first cause. So Dr. Hawking believed before he died that the universe is something that spontaneously was generated, that there was no need for a first cause, that the M theory 
um, is why we have all that we have today. Now, what's interesting to note, however, is that Dr. Hawking uh, also wrote a book earlier in 1988 called A Brief History in Time. And in that book, uh, he said this, quote, one could still imagine that God created the universe at the instant of the Big Bang or even afterwards in just such a way as to make it look as though there had been a Big Bang, end quote. So which Stephen Hawking are we to believe? The 1988 or the 2010 version? I mean, listen, this, this is a profound and great and wonderful, magnificent, uh, really from a humanly speaking stand, standpoint, um, incomprehensible uh, work of God that he would create the universe. Uh, but this is the kind of thing that we accept by faith. And if you can accept that by faith, you're going to have no problems accepting anything else by faith. I frankly would prefer the, um, the opinion of someone who held the same position that Dr. Hawking held at University of Cambridge 300 years earlier, and that would be Sir Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac Newton came to a very different conclusion when he said, quote, this is the, our, our scientist and the father of modern physics, he said, quote, this most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. This being governs all things, not as the soul of the world, but as Lord over all, and on account of his dominion, he is wont to be called Lord God, universal ruler. Amen. So a great scientist can arrive at different conclusions, um, but uh, I believe in, in uh, the account of Scripture that God created the universe, and the writer of Hebrews says here in chapter 11, that's, that's going to be the beginning point. When you can settle God is creator, you can trust him for whatever you're going through because nothing is too difficult for him. So then he begins this list here. The writer of Hebrews then begins this list and he begins this in uh, chronological order going back to the Old Testament and he's gonna give various examples. Again, 17 people by name and he's gonna start here with Abel in verse four. We'll see how far we get tonight. Uh, but he starts with Abel. I don't intend to get through all of chapter 11. Don't worry. We're going to spend a few weeks probably in chapter 11. But he says in verse 4, By faith Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith he still speaks even though he is dead. Now, he's going to clarify that further in chapter 12, verse 24. We'll get to that later, that last point. But Abel, uh, one of the first children of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel were the first two sons of Adam and Eve. Cain and Abel, by the way, did not know paradise. They never knew paradise because Adam and Eve had been expelled from the Garden of Eden before they were born. So um, they didn't know. Uh, the beauty and the wonder of the Garden of Eden. They were not permitted to go back in. Remember, after God kicked Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden, he stationed on guard some cherubim with flaming swords so that they were never able to go back into the Garden of Eden. And so Cain and Abel, having been born after that, never knew the beauty and the wonder of the Garden of Eden. One of the things that is inferred in the Genesis story is that God initiated a blood sacrifice from the moment that Adam and Eve sinned against him because it tells us that God killed an animal in order to clothe Adam and Eve with the skins of animals. There is inferred there a blood sacrifice and that this whole idea of sacrifice for the sins to make atonement of people even predates the Mosaic law. Now, it seems to also be an indication to us that the reason why Abel's sacrifice was accepted by God and Cain's was rejected is because, I'll just quote from Genesis, the Genesis account in Genesis 4.4, 4, it tells us that Abel gave to God a sacrifice from the firstborn of the flocks 
but it says that Cain in Genesis 4, 3 gave to God some of the fruits of the soil. So at some point, the two brothers come before God. They offer an offering to him. Abel has the sacrifice of the firstborn from the flocks. Cain has with him the first fruits of the soil. And the Bible says that God was displeased with Cain's sacrifice, but he accepted Abel's sacrifice. Why? Because Abel followed the prescribed method that God had given for atonement. Cain, on the other hand, circumvented God's prescribed method, and instead of bringing an animal for a sacrifice, he brought the fruit of his labor. By the way, it is a symbol or a type of the fact that Cain thought he could pr approach God through the efforts of his good works. It was the labor of his hands. It was the soil and the planting and, and then the fruit that he would harvest. But that isn't the way that God prescribed approaching him. It was always through a sacrifice. Works can never get us saved. They can never atone for anything, whatever our good intentions might be. It was that Abel followed the prescribed method and presented a sacrifice unto the Lord. And so in Genesis 4, 6, and 7, it says that the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Cain got all upset. He's like, yeah, you know, you like my brother Abel's, but you don't like what I have. And, and, and the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. And so Abel ends up being honored here as a man of faith because he approached God the way that God had said. He just accepted by faith. This is the way God says to do it. This is the way we're going to do it. Cain tried to circumvent that. And then in his anger and his bitterness and his jealousy, he kills Abel. First murder of the Bible. He kills his own brother. But his, brother, his brother's spilled blood continued to speak and we'll talk about that in chapter 12, verse 24 when he clarifies that a little bit more. So Abel's the first hero of the faith here, the first person that is mentioned here in this long list. And the next guy that's mentioned is in verse 5, and his name is Enoch. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away, for before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God, as one who pleased God. Now, we know very little about Enoch. He's mentioned to us uh, in the book of Genesis, he's mentioned to us also in the New Testament, in the book of Jude, he's also mentioned here in, in Hebrews chapter 11. His name in Hebrew means dedicated. He was the father of Methuselah. A lot of people know Methuselah, the oldest guy who ever lived recorded in, in the Bible. So Enoch is the father of Methuselah. And in Genesis chapter 5, it says that Enoch walked with God for 300 years. Now it tells us, and back in that day they lived longer, human longevity was a lot longer than it is today that Enoch lived 365 years, but it tells us in Genesis 5 that he walked with God for 300 years, meaning that when he was 65 years old is when he ha had this encounter with God and lived out the rest of his life honoring God. That's really all we know about him, and, but he lived in such a right way with God that God decided just to take him up to heaven and Enoch didn't experience physical death that Enoch was just taken, that God just took him, said, you know what, I love you, you're doing such a great job, I'm, I tell you what, I'm going to spare you the agony of death, I'm just going to take you to heaven. And that's what happened. And Enoch, you know, somehow gets this translated body on the way up, but he's just taken up to heaven. He walked with God 300 years, died at the age of 360, or was taken at the age of 365, didn't experience uh, physical death, and, and God honors him, and he, and he gets his name listed here in the hall of faith but we know nothing else about him. Just that, as verse five says, because he was commended as one who pleased God. He was commended as one who pleased God. But his life serves to be a challenge for us because look at the next verse, verse six, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him, comes to God, must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. I mean, it starts with just believing in the existence of God and then putting your faith and trust in him. And I love the way verse six says that God rewards those who earnestly seek him. You know, so often we have this, concept, this misconception of God that he is, you know, just anxious to harm or judge or punish 
But, you know, the Bible speaks often of his desire to reward us, that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. King James say, says, who diligently seek him. You know, Jesus even said in Matthew 6, 6, he talks about even, even when you pray, he says, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. And he who sees, your Father who sees what is done in secret will, what? Reward you will reward you. In Colossians 3, 23 and 24, Paul's advice to all of us in our jobs when we, when we work, when we, when we are gainfully employed, he says in Colossians 3, 23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is Christ the Lord you are serving. Hebrews 10, 35 says, do not throw away your confidence, it will be richly rewarded. And one of the last things that Jesus says recorded in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, he says in verse 12, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. God loves to reward his people. He loves to bless his kids. And he rewards us. And, and, and we don't come to him through a system of rewards. We come to him by faith. But he just loves to reward us in response for the faith that we've exercised. So he's a good God. Amen. Verse 7. By faith, Noah. We have just enough time to get through Noah tonight. And we'll pick up with Abraham two weeks from tonight after the ambassador is with us. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Now, it's kind of interesting. In the book of Genesis, Noah gets five chapters. In Hebrews 11, he gets one verse. But it's all good. I mean, it, his life is just summarized in, in one verse. The apostle Peter, when he wrote his epistle, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, he calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. I love that because here he is commended as a preacher of righteousness by the Apostle Peter, and yet only eight people in all ever got saved under his ministry. Only eight people in all, his, including himself, I mean his family, that's, that's who got saved by the ark. And by faith, Noah trusted God and built the ark in response to what God told him. Now why is this such an exercise of faith. Because God tells Noah that he's going to judge the world by a flood, a worldwide flood. Because the Bible says that mankind was only evil all the time. It had gotten that bad. That mankind was only evil all the time. So God says, I'm going to bring judgment upon the earth. But I want you to build an ark. And Noah is this preacher of righteousness. You know what that means? That means that I had somebody one time years ago trying to engage me. He was not a believer and, and, and he was a little hostile towards Christianity. And he said to me, you know, one of the problems I have with your God is the whole ark story and Noah and the ark. I said, why? Because you don't believe? He says, no, because I believe it. But what my problem is, is that God would allow how many ever people to die and only save this one family. I said, what you don't understand is you have the wrong perspective of God. God provided an ark for as many people who wanted to be rescued could be. But people decided they didn't believe, and thus they couldn't be rescued. The only people who believed was Noah's family, so only eight in all were saved. Why do you think God offered the ark? It was to save as many people as who wanted to be saved. But they, they raised a fist to God, they thumbed their nose at God, and so therefore they suffer the consequences. You can't blame God for that. God provides a, a, a vehicle to be rescued, okay? God wants none to perish but all to be saved. And the ark was an opportunity for people to get saved, to be preserved, but no, instead, only Noah and his family were rescued. Now, when you look at the Genesis account, it looks like it took Noah about 100 years to build the ark, okay? And you have to imagine, here's what's happening. He becomes the la laughing stock of his neighborhood, because when you look at the Genesis account, you understand creation. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, what it tells us is that before the flood, the earth was watered and, and um, nurtured in, in, in as, a, as somewhat of a terrarium effect. 
that in Genesis 1, 6, and 7, it speaks basically of a vapor canopy that was enclosing the earth's atmosphere. And in Genesis chapter 2, it talks about how mists would rise from the earth. The only way that God watered the earth prior to the flood was through this vapor canopy effect where it was like a terrarium where there was, you know, this self-perpetuating rotating cycle of moisture in the atmosphere and mists would come up from, from the ground. Okay, it had never rained. It had never rained up until this point. So here Noah is, he's building this ark, it's taken him a hundred years, and he's telling everybody, you better get in the ark, it's gonna rain. And they're like, what's rain? Like, well, it's gonna come out of the sky, drop us of water, it's gonna water the whole earth. You don't wanna be here when this happens because it's gonna flood the whole earth and you're gonna drown. So you need to get on the ark. Well, we don't believe it. And so over a hundred years, people are mocking him. They, they, are, they are mocking him. They're making fun of him. And he's trying to tell them it's going to rain. You know, the sky's going to break open and water's going to come from... Water's going to come from the sky. Water's never come from the sky. It comes up from the earth. Noah, don't you know the way it's been all these years? Yeah, I know. But God's going to do a different thing. You don't want to be around when that happens. So you need to get on the boat. Get on the boat. And they're like, well, we don't, we don't really believe in your whole boat. He's building a boat in his backyard. You think HOA liked that? No. <laughs> And all these people are mocking him, and they're just like, you know, this is ridiculous. He's like, I'm just telling you, this is what's going to happen. And God in his mercy has provided an ark for you. But they mock him, and he continued to build the ark by faith, trusting in something that had never happened. It had never rained, but God said he was going to bring a flood. And so Noah, in the exercise of, his, uh, exercise of his faith, trusted God, built the ark in the face of mocking and persecution of his own day. God is still looking for men and women who will be true to the Lord in the face of mocking and persecution today, still. God wants people who trust the Lord, believe God, and don't care as much about how many people might mock you for your Christian faith. Stay strong in the Lord. Be encouraged by this hall of faith. We'll keep reading the list two weeks from tonight. Read ahead as we remember the people who have gone before us, that we might take heart and be men and women of faith ourselves. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word tonight and thank you for these people who have just been great examples to us, ordinary people who have displayed extraordinary faith in you, that we would be men and women likewise who would trust you, Lord, and have a confidence and a peace uh, resting in who you are and that you are a good God who loves us and that you work all things together for our good. And we trust you, Father, and we give you glory, praise, and honor in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.